Good morning. morning. Welcome to St. Mark's Lutheran Church on this 13th Sunday after Pentecost. Uh, As always, I have some announcements. Uh, The one thing that uh, has to do with the service today is we have our annual blessing of uh, students, backpacks, or school supplies, teachers, and support staff. So we'll have the sermon, the hymn, then the hymn. Day. And then after that, um, any, anybody that falls into those categories is welcome to come forward for the blessing. Again, if, you, if you're a student and you have your backpack and or uh, school supply, you know, well, most likely you have your school supplies in the backpack, but if, uh, feel free to bring up your backpack and, um, and again, all the teachers and support staff uh, that might be here. So uh, we'll have that blessing uh, kind of in the middle of the service. So that's happening today. Um, and then this, this, this week is the week of the picnic. So that's this Saturday um, at Divertan Park starting at 11 o'clock. So um, I know uh, Linda Keller's been getting volunteers. And do you have anything to add? You want to do that now? That'd be great, yep. That's good. Thank you. Yeah, thanks for taking it. Um, anybody can come over there and start working. I'd say 8 o'clock or after for us to get prepared and the sand is what we're supposed to work here, and I don't, I don't know how things are going to go. So it'll be a lot of questions and figuring out stuff. So please be patient that day. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Yeah, thank you to Linda, who's been um, stressing. <laughs> And, and really our, our manager for this event, um, but for all of our volunteers. And again, so um, you can come here. Come, John said come in the back at 7.15 to load things up. So I'll do my best to be here by 7.15. I'm not really a morning person, but. <laughs> uh, yeah, you might need to give me a call. <laughs> uh, 
And then I think Linda said you can come to the park to volunteer as early as 8 o'clock. So, okay, that sounds great. Okay, so that's, yeah, that's our, our, our big event for this week will be the church picnic. Um, I think those are all the church highlights I have. I do have a thank you card to read that we received from Vera Morgan. Uh, she says, Dear friends at St. Mark's, thank you to my many friends at church for your cards, phone calls, thoughts, and birthday wishes for my 100th birthday. I, tre <clears throat> I treasure the card with all of your signatures from church and have received a total of 162 cards so far. I never thought I'd live this long, but I'll have to say it was one of my best birthdays ever. Thank you for my friends. Thank you. I'm sorry. Thank you, my friends, for the kindness and love you shared with me. Wishing you all 100 years of happiness. Love, Vera Morgan. So that's a really well-written card. And I'll, if it's okay, I'll hang it up at the bulletin board then. So, but, so that's wonderful. It's, it's, to me, I just think it's so neat that we were able to celebrate. Our, you know, we have a member who recently turned 100 years old. So that's great. Um, and I believe those are all the announcements I have. Are there any other announcements for the good of the congregation? Joyce? Or Delphin? Oh, that's great to hear. So Mark Kessler is, is uh, Delphin is looking more like himself and is doing much better. We know he's had uh, quite a year with the liver transplant, right? Yes, and um, so we're glad, glad to hear that. Uh, so that's a good new son to celebrate. Yes. Um, my sister Penny, her husband passed away early this morning. Oh, no. Um, it's been a long, hard week for Penny's parents for him. It's last week. Um, and we're praying for him and his family. Um, so it's been a prayer. Well, we're so sorry for your loss. And yeah, we'll definitely be keeping her in our prayers and, and the whole family. So. Are there any other announcements for the good of the congregation? Uh, yeah, I can ma mention, uh, uh, we're going to add to our prayer list too, Larry Specht. Uh, he was recently diagnosed with cancer. Uh, I'll be starting treatments I, very soon, very, I think. But anyway, um, please keep him in your prayers as well. Okay, any other um, announcements for the good of the congregation? Okay, well then we prepare our hearts for worship with the prelude. Mm -hmm.
I, <clears throat> I invite the congregation to please rise in body or spirit. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. God of all mercy and consolation, come to the help of your people, turning us from our sin to live for you alone. Give us the power of your Holy Spirit that we may confess our sin, receive your forgiveness, and grow into the fullness of Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. Amen. Let us confess our sin in the presence of God and of one another. Gracious God, have mercy on us. We confess that we have turned from you and given ourselves into the power of sin. We are truly sorry and humbly repent. In your compassion, forgive us our sins, known and unknown, things we have done and things we have failed to do. Turn us again to you and uphold us by your spirit so that we may live and serve you in newness of life through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. In the mercy of Almighty God, Jesus Christ was given to die for us, and for his sake God forgives us all our sins. As a call and ordained minister of the Church of Christ, and by his authority, I therefore declare to you the entire forgiveness of all your sins. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. And also with you. And let us pray. Ever loving God, your Son gives himself as living bread for the life of the world. Fill us with such a knowledge of his presence that we may be strengthened and sustained by his risen life to serve you continually. Through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Please be seated.
The first reading for this, the 13th Sunday after Pentecost, is taken from the ninth chapter of Proverbs, beginning at the first verse. Wisdom has built her house. She has hewn her seven pillars. She has slaughtered her animals. She has mixed her wine. She has also set her table. She has sent out her servant girl. She calls from the highest places in the town. You that are simple, turn in here. To those without sense, she says, come, eat of my bread and drink of the wine I have mixed. Lay aside immaturity and live and walk in the way of insight. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let's read responsibly now Psalm 34 in the bulletin. Fear the Lord, you saints of the Lord, for those who fear the Lord lack nothing. The lions are in want, but those who seek the Lord have nothing that is good. Come, children, and listen to me. I will teach you reverence for the Lord. Who among you takes pleasure in life and desires the own life to enjoy prosperity? Keep your tongue from evil and your lips from lying words. Turn from evil and do good. Seek peace and pursue it. The second reading is taken from the fifth chapter of Paul's letter to the Ephesians. Be careful then how you live, not as unwise people, but as wise, making the most of the time because the days are evil. So do not be foolish, but understand what the will of the Lord is. Do not get drunk with wine, for that is debauchery, but be filled with the Spirit as you sing hymns and psalms and spiritual songs among yourselves, singing and making melody to the Lord in your hearts. Give thanks to the God and Father at all times, for everything in the name of our Lord, for everything in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. I invite the congregation to please rise for the, the reading of the gospel. The Holy Gospel according to St. John, the sixth chapter. Glory, Glory to you, O Lord. 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 Jesus said, I am the living bread that came down from heaven. Whoever eats of this bread will live forever, and the bread that I will give you for the life of the world is my flesh. The Jews then disputed amongst themselves, saying, How can this man give us his flesh to eat? So Jesus said to them, Very truly I tell you, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. Those who eat my flesh and drink my blood have eternal life, and I will raise them up on the last day. For my flesh is true food, and my blood is true drink. Those who eat my flesh and drink my blood abide in me, and I in them. Just as the living Father sent me, and I live because of the Father. So whoever eats me will live because of me. This is the bread that came down from heaven, not like that which your ancestors ate, and they died. But the one who eats this bread will live forever. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. Please be seated, and I'd like to invite the children forward for the children's message. All right, good morning. I'm sure, most of you, I'm sure most of you have noticed that God creates us all to be different. And you know, when we're in school, that really becomes apparent. You know, as, as, you're, as you're in school, you, you know, you get to know your classmates, and it doesn't take long you get to see that, you know, some, some students are really good at math, some students are good at science, some students are good at, at reading and writing, Others are good at history, some are good at art or music or sports, all different stuff. But when you're in school, you really can see 
that God creates us to be different. And that's a good thing. So um, that allows um, you know, people to, do, to kind of specialize and, and, again, help each other. So it's a good thing that God creates us to be different. And we have different interests as well. <clears throat> Not everybody has the same, same hobbies. But there are some areas... <clears throat> so, again, God creates us to be different, and that's good. But there are some areas God tells us where we should be alike, where we should all kind of behave in the same way. And one area where God wants us to kind of be alike is God wants us all to be wise. He wants us all to be wise. So in the one Bible lesson that was read today by Mr. Strew Herrick, it said, the Bible lesson said, be careful then how you live, not as unwise people, but as wise, making the most of the time. So do not be foolish, but understand what the will of the Lord is. So God wants us to be wise. Now, what does that mean? I kind of said it in those last few words, but do you know what it means to be wise? Well, wow, that's kind of true to be experienced and to be, especially to be experienced in knowing what is right and what is wrong or what is good and what is evil. So the Bible says to be wise and it says here it's where to understand the will of the Lord. So remember always when God is good. So God wants us to be wise and he wants us to know what is right and wrong, good and evil, and to make the choice for good and what is right, okay? So what this means is that every day, every day we should be asking ourselves, what does God want me to do? Or what does Jesus want me to do? So to be wise, to do what is good, to do what is right, we should always be asking ourselves, what does God want me to do? And what helps us know what, what God would want us to do? What helps us to know? Is it just a mystery? It's not a complete mystery. Sometimes it's a little tough to know, but what helps us? What book helps you? The Bible, and more specifically, certain parts in the Bible. So I'm going to soon give you a handout with at least a few of those parts of the Bible that help you. So there's parts of the Bible that you should try your best to kind of memorize and always keep with you, and they'll help you know um, what is right and what is wrong. So what are some of those parts? So on the paper, I'm going to give you the first one. The first thing I've listed are the Ten Commandments. So you probably know at least some of those, right? Can you name one or two? Samuel? Okay, don't take God's name in vain. Don't misuse God's name, Alex. Well, okay, that's a good, that's one I have on the other side. So another, so one part of the Bible is the Ten Commandments. Were you going to name, Mary, were you going to name a Ten Commandments? Uh, do, not steal. do not steal. Very good. So the Ten Commandments we should know. Another one is the Golden Rule. So that's another part comes from the Bible. I have it down here is Matthew Chapter 7, verse 12. And what is the golden rule? Treat people, how you want to be treated. Treat people how you want to be treated. So that's very good. The other thing I wrote down here for you is what Jesus says are the two most important commandments. You know what those are? It has to do with love. Well, well that's one of the Ten Commandments, so that's good. But what is Jesus are the two most important commandments? Love. Love one another, so that's the second most. What's the most important? Um, love, um, people, um, love God. Love God, exactly. So the one thing I didn't write down, there's also some great stories or parables in the Bible that teach us right from wrong. And um, one of the, probably one of the most well-known one that you hopefully know is the Good Samaritan. Do you know that one? That's a great one that teaches us how God wants us to live. So God creates us all to be different. We have different skills, 
We're good at different things. We have different hobbies, and that's all a good thing. But there's some ways God wants us to be alike, and one of those is he wants us all to be wise. So he wants us every day to think, ask ourselves, what does God want me to do? And the way we know what God wants us to do is by trying to remember some of those key parts of the Bible that teach us right from wrong. So after our prayer, I'll give you these little sheets, and they're, they're, that's a good place to start. And then there's some other key places in the Bible, too, that help. But, um, but I'll give you, I'll hand those out in a minute. So will you please pray with me? Or let us pray. Lord Jesus, today we are reminded that not everything in our world is good or good for us. We ask that you would always be our God in life and to help us to remember the teachings in the Bible that help us to make wise decisions. Amen. Okay, here you want... Okay, thank you. Oh, sure. Can I pass three of these down? Thanks. And you'll notice on the Ten Commandments for the kids, I, if it's in parentheses, it's one of my words I use to try to make it more understandable. And then there's one commandment. It still means the same thing, but I changed the wording. Number six, I changed the wording a little bit. <laughs> I thought to make it more kid-friendly. Although it's not, it doesn't change the meaning. But so I did, I did um, make a few edits to those Ten Commandments, but I didn't, I didn't change the commandment. <laughs> And let us pray. Lord, may the words of my mouth and the meditation of all of our hearts be acceptable in your sight. O Lord, our strength and our redeemer. Amen. One of the phrases I've heard as for as long as I can remember is, you are what you eat. You are what you eat. And to be honest, this was a phrase that I would hear occasionally but I would hardly ever think about. So this week I did a Google search on the origins of this phrase. And it's possible that the saying originated with a French gastronome, lawyer, and politician who used this in, his, uh, used this in a book he wrote in 1826. I believe... So I put it, so I didn't actually use the phrase, you are what you eat. In the book it said, tell me what you eat and I will tell you what you are. And I wrote down the name because I don't know how to pronounce that. I know, I know the first word is uh, Jean, but I don't know about the rest for sure. Well, from what I found online, the phrase basically means what you eat has a, uh, has a significant impact on your health and your mental well-being. So you are what you eat, so it has, a, has an impact, your, what you eat has an impact on your health as well as your mental well-being is the thinking. And I'm sure that's, that's a thought that probably most of us would agree with, that we kind of feel maybe, uh, we overall feel better if we eat a little bit a little bit healthier. So that's, like I said, that's a phrase I've heard my whole life, although it's one I never really thought about before. And uh, that's, that's where it appears to come from, 1826, from this French um, gastronome. Well, for Christians, that phrase, you are what you eat, is very true. Very true. And the gospel, according to St. John, we, we do not find... I'm sorry, so in the Gospel according to St. John, it's the only one of the four Gospels where we do not find Jesus instituting the sacrament of Holy Communion. However, with this Gospel, 
we find the most detailed explanation of the Holy, of Holy Communion in the Bible. As Lutheran Christians, as Lutheran Christians, we believe that at Holy Communion, we are truly eating the flesh of the Son of Man and drinking his blood. We believe this for several reasons. One is because of the Last Supper account in the Gospels according to St. Matthew, Mark, and Luke. Again, those are the only three where we find Jesus instituting the sacrament of Holy Communion. That's one reason. Another is because of St. Paul's teachings in 1 Corinthians chapter 11. There's also a couple other uh, passages in the Bible that support this belief. Some of them even come from the Old Testament. But the passage that really drives this belief is John chapter 6. Now, the sad reality of Holy Communion is that this is part of our faith that Christians tend to argue about. Holy Communion is about eternal life, as Jesus says in verse 54. It's about helping to become more like Jesus, to be one with him. Again, we are what we eat. And it's also meant, Holy Communion is also meant to bring Christians together. However, as we see every day, God has given us free will. God has made us all a little different from one another. And therefore, human beings will always argue with each other. We will always have some different ideas. And we even see that in regards to the Bible. Again, the idea that we're different is sometimes a really good thing. It helps make society work. And at other times, it can sadly break us apart. And that's kind of what we've seen in the church. We disagree, and it kind of we form different denominations and things like that. So sadly, Holy Communion... It's meant to bring us together, and I would say it does. It definitely does, but it, it's something we argue about as Christians. So among Protestants, Lutherans are one of the very few denominations that believe in the real presence of Holy Communion. So as Martin Luther says in the small catechism, it is the true body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ under the bread and wine instituted by Christ himself for us Christians to eat and drink. So that's the Lutheran view. That comes from, that quote is from Luther's small catechism. Well, even so, among Protestants, we're one of the few that believe in the, the real presence. That's truly the body and blood of Jesus. But even among Christians who believe in the real presence of Holy Communion, there is some debate. So even those who share the same beliefs still, still find time to argue. The debate that I am most familiar with is between Lutherans and Roman Catholics. In both denominations, we believe that the, when the words of institution are spoken, so again, those words begin with, in the night in which he was betrayed, we both believe that once those words have been spoken, the bread and wine has now been consecrated. So it has now been changed. It is no longer just bread and wine. So we believe at that moment, it is now changed. It is now the true body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ under the bread and wine. Now, the Roman Catholic Church uses a term Call, I put it at the bottom, transubstantiation to describe the process of this belief. The term that's given for the Lutheran belief, although I don't think Lutherans really use it, but it's, we tend to just say the real presence. But the word that's kind of been given to us is consubstantiation. So there's two fancy words there. Now, basically, what we're arguing over is the word under, more or less. As Lutherans, we believe that at Holy Communion, we are receiving the true body and blood of Jesus Christ and bread and wine. So it's under the bread and wine. So we believe that we're receiving both. We're receiving the body and blood of Jesus and bread and wine. 
The Roman Catholic Church believes that at Holy Communion, Christians are receiving the true body and blood of Jesus Christ under the appearance of bread and wine. Now, I think we're saying the same thing. But many, many, many theologians and pastors and lay people will say, no, there's a disagreement. And that's why we have words like transubstantiation and consubstantiation. So we both believe in the real presence, but even though we both believe that, we still argue a little bit. Are we receiving the body and blood of Jesus and bread and wine, or is it just look, taste, and smell like bread and wine, but it's only the body and blood of Jesus? So again, even Christians that apparently believe in the same thing, we still, we still argue about some of the finer points. So that, sadly, that's common. But what's sad, what's sad about all of these arguments, whether you believe in the real presence or not, or you believe in the real presence, and we're arguing about some of those types of terminology, is that we sometimes forget about the words here in John chapter 6. And that's what we really need to focus on, is, is Jesus' words and his promises. Jesus gives us the gift of Holy Communion for several reasons. And I'm only going to really mainly focus on two today. One is for eternal life. And another is so that we will become what we eat. Jesus ex starts to explain all of this to a group of Israelites who are following him. But a little bit like today, the people get confused. Now, it makes a lot of sense why this group of people from our reading was so confused. For one thing, Jesus is speaking about future events here. Jesus says, I am the living bread that came down from heaven. Whoever eats of this bread will live forever. And the bread that I will give for the life of the world is my flesh. So now, And the bread that I will give, for the life of the world is my flesh. So Jesus is speaking here about his death, resurrection, and the future gift of Holy Communion. And the people gathered here are being told about a future that they really cannot contemplate. Although, to be fair to Jesus, these people do not give him much time, let alone faith, to prove that what he is saying is true. So they, they, it makes sense why they don't understand, but they also don't give Jesus much of a chance. They want things now, <laughs> which is very human. The other reason why Jesus' words are so difficult to accept from this original audience is because it appears to go against Scripture. On the one hand, it appears that Jesus is advocating for cannibalism here. And even today, many non-Christians view Holy Communion as a sort of cannibalism. I've, I've talked to non-Christians, and I, I know this is a view that's common among them. Also, when, when you think about non-Christians, always remember that they do not know all the denominational differences that we're aware of. They just know what they hear out in the public and in the media and they put together a picture of Christianity, which is usually not very accurate of any one particular denomination. So they just hear st stuff from Baptists and Catholics and Lutherans and Pentecostals, and they just put together a form of Christianity. So always remember, they don't know all the denominational differences in theology that we know. But going back to the Israelites of John chapter 6, Jesus' words appear to also go against Leviticus chapter 17, verse 14, which states, For the life of every creature, its blood is its life. Therefore I have said to the people of Israel, You shall not eat the blood of any creature, for the life of every creature is its blood. Whoever eats it shall be cut off. So it looks like Jesus is a blasphemer from that. Now, it's interesting. This is one of the verses 
that those of us who believe in the real presence use to defend the belief in the real presence. However, again, the Israelites could not see that at this moment. So again, it makes sense why these Israelites struggled with Jesus' words here. Now, what's so beautiful about these words and the sacrament of Holy Communion is that they show us that God loves us so much that the Son of God wants to give his life to us so that we may live forever. Again, Leviticus says, for the life of every creature, its blood is its life. Its blood is its life. And what does Jesus command us to do but to drink of his blood so that we may have life? He's asking us to take his blood so that we may have life. So one of the, one of the really wonderful things about the, the gift of Holy Communion is it's about eternal life, making sure we are receiving God's life. Now another reason for this gift of Holy Communion is so that we would become what we eat. I have always found helpful Martin Luther's words in the large catechism in which he calls Holy Communion food for the soul. I don't have a slide for that one, but he calls it in the large catechism food for the soul. And this food for the soul is meant to help us become more like Jesus. By receiving Holy Communion, we not only receive God's grace, but we become tabernacles for our Lord. And as tabernacles for our Lord, we are called to carry that knowledge with us all week long as we try to live out the commandments of God. So God's not only watching us, watching over us all week long, but he's inside of us. We're carrying him around with him. And that should hopefully affect how we behave. And we see how we behave on earth is very important to God. In our second lesson, St. Paul says, be careful then how you live, not as unwise people, but as wise, making the most of the time because the days are evil. So do not be foolish, but understand what the will of the Lord is. Do not get drunk with wine, for this is debauchery, but be filled with the Spirit. And our psalm has a similar message. In Psalm 34, we are told, Fear the Lord, you saints of the Lord, for those who fear the Lord lack nothing. Keep your tongue from evil and your lips from lying words. Turn from evil and do good. Seek peace and pursue it. Again, God wants us to become what we eat. God wants us to be like the Son of God, our Lord and Savior. Our time on earth is important to God. And God calls us to use this time to come to know him and also to prepare ourselves to live with him in his kingdom for all of eternity. So our time on earth prepares us for the kingdom of God. So living a life that is devoted to God, to our families, and to our communities is a life that is, that is preparing us for the eternal kingdom of God. God does not want us to be God does not want us to be focused only on ourselves. St. Paul uses the example of drunkenness to illustrate a life that is, is only focused inward. Now, if anyone is struggling with addiction, it's very important that we help them in any way that we can. So St. Paul is not trying to put people down here. That's not his purpose, not putting people down. Instead, he's reminding us that Jesus wants us to follow in his example and to devote ourselves to the well-being of those around us. God wants us to always be looking beyond ourselves. Now, as I always say, there is nothing wrong with us sometimes doing some things for ourselves. Self-care is important. 
But God does not want us to only be focused on ourselves. That's the point that St. Paul is trying to make. Again, God is calling us to be what, to become what we eat. And what did Jesus focus on? But the well-being of others. Jesus gave up his life to help other people. And God is calling us to live in a, in a similar way that we focus also beyond ourselves and de dedicate our lives to serving others. Now, as you might be able to tell, Holy Communion is really one of my favorite topics. There's things I want to talk about. I don't have time to about communion. I love talking about Holy Communion. But I'll be honest, it took me a while to understand the, the Lutheran Christian belief of the real presence of Holy Communion. And before, and I'll be very honest, before I entered seminary, I was never excited to come to church and see that it was a Holy Communion Sunday. Because every time I thought to myself, I, every time I saw the, the communion on the altar, I thought, oh no, the service is gonna be longer. <laughs> I'm, I'm ashamed of that today. <laughs> but that really was my original thought. It took me a while to understand the amazing gift that I was receiving from God. Holy Communion is a reminder of our Lord Jesus' true love for us. It reminds us, reminds us of his desire to be united with us for all of eternity. And it teaches us his desire for us to become what we eat. Although Holy Communion is food for the soul, as we see from our second lesson in our psalm, God does not take away our free will. And we need to remind ourselves that Jesus is truly with us and he's calling us to live in his example. So Holy Communion strengthens our faith, but it doesn't, God doesn't take away our free will. So we have to keep reminding ourselves God is with us. And God is calling me to be wise. Again, God does, not want it, uh, God does not want us to take our time on earth lightly. Instead, God wants us to remember that our years on earth is a time to come to know the love and mercy of God. It's a time to accept his help. And he helps us in various ways. And one of them, again, is that food for the soul of receiving his body and blood. And then God wants us to use this time to follow in his example, to live a life that is focused on the good of those around us. So God truly wants us to become what we eat. Amen. Amen.
So at this time, if I could invite all the students, teachers, and any support staff to come forward. And we'll do the offering after the blessing, okay? So if you got be a real good, you got the, Yep, feel free to bring your backpacks if you have. If not, it's no problem. You might spread out a little bit. Okay. Are there any other teachers or support staff that want to come forward? You sure? Okay. Sorry to put you on the spot. Okay, um, you guys, you want to come a little closer? Yeah, everybody look like a church family. All right. So a reading from Mark chapter 10. People were bringing little children to Jesus in order that he might touch them. And the disciples spoke sternly to them. When Jesus saw this, he was indignant and said to them, let the, let the little children come to me. Do not stop them, for it is such as these that the kingdom of God belongs. Truly, I tell you, whoever does not receive the kingdom of God as a little child will never enter it. And he took them up in his arms, laid his hands on them, and blessed them. The word of the Lord. So that's a great reminder. Again, Jesus' Jesus's love is for everyone, no matter how old we are. We are loved and important to Jesus. So that's, I know that's one of my favorite passages. Well, my first blessing is going to be for all of you students. So let us pray. Dear God, as we ready to start another year in school, we ask for your blessing on these, or first on these backpacks and all the devices and other school supplies that they will carry. And we especially ask for your blessing on these children who will be using these school supplies and starting a new school year here very soon. As they do the very important work of being students, bless them with eagerness to learn that their world may grow large. Respect for teachers and students, that they may form healthy relationships. Love for nature, that they may become caretakers of your creation. Happiness when learning is easy, and stick to itiveness when it is hard. Faith in Jesus as their best teacher and closest friend. We ask that you would protect these, your own children. Watch over them and keep them safe as they travel to and from school. As they learn, help them also to discover the different gifts that you have given each one of them to be used in your work in the world. As they hear the many voices that will fill their days, help them to listen most carefully to your voice, the one that tells them you will love them always, no matter what. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. And I have another scripture reading, and this is good for everyone, but a little more geared to teachers and support staff. So 1 Corinthians chapter 12, St. Paul writes, Now there are varieties of gifts, but the same Spirit. There are varieties of services, but the same Lord. And there are varieties of activities, but it is the same God who activates all of them and everyone. To each is given the manifestation of the Spirit for the common good. So no matter what, we're, what our work may be in the education system, God has called us to do that work and it, it all contributes to the learning of these, of these young people. So our last prayer is, is again for the student, no, I'm sorry, teachers and support staff. Now let us pray for teachers, support staff, daycare workers, and all those who work in the field of education. God of wisdom, your son came among us as a teacher. Send your blessing on all who are engaged in the work of education. Give them clearness of vision and freshness of thought, and enable them so to train the hearts and minds of their students, that they may grow in wisdom and be prepared to face the challenges of life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. So thank you for coming forward. I know most, 
Some of you are starting school Wednesday, so Frederick County's Wednesday. My boys are the 26th in Washington County, and then you're in Pennsylvania. When do you start? 27th. So you're the day after, I think, these guys, so my kids. So, All right, so everybody's starting really soon. You're re really, really soon. <laughs> So but we wish you all a wonderful school year, and if there's anything our church can do to support you in your studies, uh, please let us know. So again, thank you for coming forward, and we just, again, continue to ask for God's blessing on your new school year. All right, thank you. I invite the congregation to please rise in body or spirit. And with the whole church, we confess our faith using the words from the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate. He was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Calling on the spirit of wisdom to guide our hearts and our minds. Let us pray for the church, the world, and all in Dear Father, feed us with wisdom and righteousness. Fill us with your Holy Spirit. Nourish us with the love and life of your dear Son. Merciful God, receive our prayer. 
nourish the church with the fine bread and choice wine of Jesus' own body and blood. Fill up with your heavenly light and life. Let that light cheer many hearts and guide many lives to you. Merciful God, receive our prayer. Give wisdom, graciousness, and prudence to all who are persecuted for Jesus' sake. Use their witness to strengthen our faith and to call their tormentors to repentance and salvation. Merciful God, receive our prayer. Feed the members of our congregation with the spirit of wisdom and understanding, counsel and might, knowledge and fear of the Lord, and joy in your presence. Give us grace to gladly share this feast with our families, friends, neighbors, and communities. Merciful God, receive our prayer. Bless all those who are returning to school this month. We pray for all teachers, administrators, support staff, students, parents, and all those who work in the field of education. We ask for your presence in all of our schools, that this would be a safe and productive new school year. Merciful God. As wisdom sets her feast before everyone, move the hearts of earthly rulers to heed her invitation and sit at her table. Feed them all they Feed them all they need to think, speak, and act in accordance with your will. Let all who are entrusted to their care prosper and live in peace. Merciful God, you hear the cries of the righteousness and, all, and of all who suffer. Hear and graciously answer our prayers on behalf of all who are afflicted by pain, grief, shame, or despair. And we especially lift up those who are known to us. We lift up Irene, Mike, Mark, Stephanie, Ruthie, Gail, Avery, Leah, Connie, Harold, Larry, Evan, and for the family of Philip Millison, and all those we now name aloud are in our hearts. Restore their health, hope, and joy in the company of all who love them. Merciful God. Receive our prayer. Heavenly Father, thank you for our beloved dead, who with St. Peter said to Jesus, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. Please strengthen our faith in your dear Son and fill us with your Spirit. Lead us safely through this life into the fullness of your kingdom. There, with all of whom you have redeemed, we shall rejoice in your great love forever. Merciful God, we lift up these prayers to you, gracious God. Receive them into your holy keeping. Amen. Gathered into one by the Holy Spirit, let us pray as Jesus taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we give the, those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. The blessing of God who provides for us, feeds for us, and journeys with us be upon you now and forever.